Hello everyone and welcome to today's briefing room on our hot off the press report released today. My name is Michael Lee and I'm the Acting Head of Strategy at Climate Work Centre. And I'll be your host for today as we talk you through our findings on how to reduce Australia's transport emissions. But first, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which each of us is starting in today. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I also extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. Please feel free to use the chat to tell us where you're dialing in from. Last time you saw me in a briefing room event, we were launching Decarbonisation Scenarios 2023, which showed that Australia can do it, still do its part to help the world meet the Paris Agreement goals of limiting uh, global warming to well below two degrees and 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. The 2023 modelling identified a decarbonisation pathway for the transport sector, primarily through technology change, focusing on zero emissions vehicles. The transport decarbonisation scenarios we're going to speak about today build on our decarbonisation scenarios 2023 to explore the benefits of diverse solutions across freight and passenger transport. The report and the modelling within it demonstrates how diverse solutions can fortify efforts to reduce Australia's transport emissions. As the Australian government prepares its own national transport decarbonisation plan, it has the opportunity to take this diverse solutions approach, giving the sector more opportunities to successfully decarbonise. Over the next hour, we'll hear from Helen Rowe, our transport program lead here at Climaworks, who will introduce us to the project and how this work can help inform a credible plan to decarbonise Australia's transport sector. Next up, Lily Rao, who was the lead author of the report, will deep dive into the key findings of the modelling. As a reminder, we will be taking your questions a little later on, but please submit them at any time via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now let's kick off with our first presenter. It's my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Helen Rowe. As ClimateWorks Transport Program Lead, Helen works with government and industry stakeholders to define a common vision and action plan to move the sector to zero emissions. Helen has held leadership roles in consulting, not-for-profits and government, including as the Director of Sustainable Transport Programs at the Victorian Department of Transport. And she was also Head of Innovation and Strategy at the startup Co-Design Studio. She has experience in research roles and is currently completing a doctorate in sustainable transport and system change. Over to you, Helen. Thanks so much, Michael, for that introduction. And thanks so much, everyone, for coming along today and joining us to hear a bit more about this report. So before I throw to Lily to go into the details of our modelling a bit more, I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about why we've chosen to do this modelling and, and why now. So to start with, what we know is that transport's currently the third largest source of emissions in Australia, but it's also the fastest growing. So we're expecting that if we stay on the current track, uh, it'll be the largest source of emissions in Australia by the end of the decade. So that means that really Australia can't meet its, its uh, emissions reduction goals without tackling transport. To date, we've tended to put our efforts uh, around decarbonisation. We've tended to you know, put all our eggs in the EV basket as such, uh, really focusing on zero emission vehicles, including passenger cars and, and trucks. So this means that when we're doing modelling to look at how we can reach our emissions reduction goals, as long as we're focusing, focusing on this as the major solution, what we tend to see coming out of our modelling is quite rapid rates of, of zero EV, of zero emission vehicle uptake in the near term. But that can be a bit of a challenge. So what we've looked at recently is that um, there's been fairly modest rates of EV uptake to date, uh, whether it's in passenger vehicle, but also quite low uptake in, in things like freight, in trucks uh, and vans. So that's made us think a bit, bit further and look a bit wider around what are the range of solutions we could be putting on the table to decarbonise transport. So that's basically what our new modelling does, incorporate new solutions, looking for more options to, to, to crank the wheel in, in transport emissions reduction. So in a nutshell, our scenario modelling shows how Australia can bolster its transport emissions reduction through expanding the suite of solutions we're looking at. And that by doing that, we think Australia can get its emissions reduction on track and, and keep them on track through to 2050. So I guess the next question is, is, is why now? 
So based on this context, we think that uh, to use a transport metaphor, transport should be the next cab off the rank if we're thinking about where Australia needs to target its, its efforts around decarbonisation. Uh, there's been a strong focus to date on uh, electricity and energy, but on the pathway that transport on is on at the moment, that should be the next major focus. Importantly, at the moment, we don't have a comprehensive plan for how we're going to do this. So uh, without that plan, we're at a bit of a crossroads currently. Uh, but based on the discussion at the moment and where we're seeing uh, major uh, decarbonisation plans come out and policies, they've been turned to be focusing on electric vehicles. But I guess the good thing this year is we've got an opportunity to get it right. So uh, as Michael alluded to, the uh, federal government recently put out its consultation roadmap for its transport and infrastructure sector plan. So this gives us an opportunity to get the settings right, not just for the federal government, but thinking about all levels of government and the role they can play in setting a path to decarbonising transport. So our new modelling looks at what could be a credible pathway to decarbonise transport that we hope can help inform this work to get the settings right. Uh, Conversely, if we don't look at diversifying the solutions we've got in place, uh, we think that you can also see a, a risk that Australia won't align to that 1.5 degree target um, set out in the Paris in the Paris Agreement. So Lee's going to go into a bit more detail, but just as a sort of an overview, based on the findings we've set out in the report, we're, we're calling for a shift in the way trans government is thinking about how we decarbonise transport. Firstly, as I've just sort of said, looking at expanding out the suite of solutions we're looking at, whether that's including things like mode shift to public transport, walking and cycling, or actually even mode shift in freight. So looking at more, more freight travel happening by train rather than uh, by trucks. It can also involve reducing a small portion of trips through building in extra efficiencies in the transport network. At the same time, we haven't forgotten about electric vehicles uh, and, uh, and zero emission trucks. Uh, they're still a really important part of the picture. Uh, and we think to get across the finishing line in terms of our emission reduction goal, we still need to be pushing as, as hard as possible. And that includes uh, doing as most as we can to, to push off uh, and build up from the current levels of uptake we're seeing in Australia. Something else we've also looked at in the report is also thinking about what's the transport system we're going to create through this decarbonisation approach? So that involves considering the additional benefits of a pathway to decarbonise transport that goes beyond just thinking about emissions. So something we've looked at in the report, for example, is what's going to be the broader impact on the, on the transport network as a whole. Uh, and I guess the way we look at it is if the nation chooses to just replace every car and every truck with a zero emission option, as the population grows and as the economy grows, that could exacerbate current, current issues, for example, congestion, given that most of us live and work in, in, in urban areas where that's already a problem. At the end of the day, traffic is still traffic and shifting to a zero emission uh, option is, is not going to change that situation. But through these diverse solutions, we can look at getting a, a healthier mix uh, in, in transport to, to move ahead with. So with that context in place, and I'm certainly happy to answer some questions at the end of Lily's presentation to talk more about that. But uh, it's my pleasure to throw back to Michael for the next step in the presentation. Hey, Gail, and thanks for that overview. And I mean, traffic is still traffic is just the perfect headline for one of the key themes that we are um, trying to put out with this report that's just come out today and that you'll hear about in this presentation that's coming up from Lily. Um, but I guess a couple of the key takeaways from Helen's presentation um, and speech just now is that really one is that um, how important it is to be looking at the diversity of solutions that are available to decarbonise any sector, particularly transport, and the importance of really kind of pushing all the levers that we have available. And the report will highlight some of the benefits and opportunities to do that within transport. I think the other really important key message from Helen is around the timing of, uh, of this conversation where there's an opportunity now for the Australian government and um, Australia's transport sector as a whole to be to be really thinking ahead. Um, you know, it's really important to be looking at long-term planning and what the future might look like. And so it's a really opportune time for us to be investigating, well, what are the actual options for us to, to decarbonise transport in the long term? Now on a logistical matter, we have seen some raised hands coming up um, over the past few minutes. So if you do have any questions, just a reminder uh, that to, you can submit any of those via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you've just joined us, welcome to Climate Centre's briefing room event. We're talking about our latest report, Decarbonising Australia's Transport Sector, which we released today. My name is Michael Lee. I'm the Acting Head of Strategy at Climate Works. 
And we've just heard from Helen Rome, who just gave an introduction to the project and said that why now is the time to expand Australia's approach to transport decarbonisation. Next up, we have Lily Rao, who is going to take us through the research findings showing the benefits of taking a diverse solutions approach. Lily is a senior project manager in the transport team, where she engaged with, with, with government and industry stakeholders to drive decarbonisation in the transport sector. Before joining the transport team, Lily worked in Climeworks industry team, where she supported the Australian Industry Energy Transitions Initiative, which found that it's possible to achieve net zero emissions across Australia's heavy industry supply chains. Lily has over a decade of experience in the environmental sector, and before joining Climeworks, she was a senior marketing manager at Lime, where she was responsible for leading campaigns for sustainable transportation in North America, Australia, and New Zealand. Over to you, Lily, for a closer look at the modelling results. Thank you very much, Michael, and thanks to Helen for that great introduction to our work. I'll now be taking you all through the results of the modelling. So our new transport modeling compares scenarios using two different factors or levers to decarbonize the transport sector. The first lever we looked at in the report is the mix of decarbonization solutions deployed in each of our scenarios. So as mentioned, this modeling builds on previous modeling work uh, that looked at technology change and it explores a broader mix of decarbonization solutions. This modeling was designed with impact in mind. We wanted to create the evidence that shows how and why the Australian government should go beyond electric vehicles as they design the transport sector's national decarbonization plan. We designed our scenarios around the avoid shift and improve framework, which you can see here on the slide. It classifies transport decarbonization strategies into three categories. Starting from the right-hand side, our previous modeling focused on that improve, which is to say it focused on the technology transition, mainly zero emissions vehicle uptake. These scenarios are referred to as our technology only scenarios. We compared this with our diverse solution scenarios, which includes avoid and shift solutions, as well as those improve, and improve solutions. These additional solutions, starting from the left-hand side now, are to avoid the need for some travel and make car and truck tri trips shorter and more efficient, as well as shifting some travel to lower emissions modes, referred to as mode shift, such as traveling by train instead of by plane, using more active and public transport, and moving more, rail by, more freight by rail. Improve solutions that improve um, the vehicle and fuel efficiency, like getting more zero emissions vehicles on the road, are, are also included in our diverse solution scenarios. So now let's take a look at our second lever. The second lever is zero emissions vehicle uptake rate. So to align with ClimateWorks' economy-wide 1.5 degree scenario for Australia using a technology-only approach, the transport sector would see rapid zero emissions vehicle uptake across both light, light vehicles and trucks. What we're seeing on this slide is the modeled uptake for light vehicles specifically, which shows 73% of all new light vehicle sales would be zero emissions by 2030, shown in that dark purple line. Acknowledging that this is quite a high level of uptake, we also explored the emissions impact of a slower pace to reflect the potential real world delays in the technology transition. We modeled this moderated uptake across all vehicles, but again, looking just at light vehicles in this graph, this moderated pace would see 57% of all new light vehicle sales being zero emissions by 2030, shown in the lighter purple line. Notably, both uptakes, both the rapid and the moderated levels, exceed current federal sales projections and a state and territory aggregated target at 2030, which you can see in the green dot and the black diamond. So taking these two levers we've just discussed, we combine them to create our four different scenarios. You can see that first lever, mix of decarbonization solutions across the bottom and the pace of zero emissions vehicle uptake is on the y-axis with the moderated on the bottom and the rapid pace on the top. Starting from the left-hand side, 
The two scenarios in orange represent the technology only scenarios, which are primarily focused on the transition to zero emissions vehicles. We've then applied the two rates of uptake to those scenarios to understand what the emissions impact might be with different paces of uptake. Then on the right-hand side, we see the two diverse solution scenarios in blue. These scenarios include solutions from across the avoid, shift, and improve framework, notably with the addition of mode shift and reduced travel activity to understand the emissions reduction potential of that broader suite of solutions. The diverse solution scenarios still include transitioning technology, so we've applied both paces of zero emissions uptake to these two scenarios as well. The way that these two levers are used can make all the difference in reducing transport emissions, and our modeling shows how they can be combined so that transport can hold its own in aligning Australia to 1.5 degrees and under what, condition, what conditions they may fall short of that pathway. So now, let's get into the results. We'll now be looking at the cumulative emissions by 2050 for each of our four scenarios. So that first column that you see here and the dotted line is our emissions benchmark, which is the total greenhouse gas emissions released by the transport sector between 2025 and 2050 in ClimateWorks' economy-wide 1.5 degree scenario for Australia. We use this benchmark to compare the performance of each of our scenarios. Scenarios where emissions uh, exceed this benchmark pass the burden of emissions reductions to other sectors in order for Australia to remain 1.5 aligned. In this scenario, focused on technology solutions, emissions reductions are achieved by a rapid uptake of zero emissions vehicles. 72% of all new vehicle sales across both light vehicles and trucks would be zero emissions by 2030. Any delays in reaching this rapid level of uptake would see Australia overshoot this emissions benchmark. So now let's take a look at the moderated rate of uptake. The light orange bar uh, represents transport emissions in a scenario where there is a moderated zero emissions vehicle uptake and no other solutions are implemented. As you can see, with this slower rate of uptake, a technology only approach results in a 21% increase in emissions over the same time period. In this scenario, Australia overshoots the transport emissions benchmark as early as 2041, which could affect the nation's ability to decarbonize in line with 1.5 degrees. And to stay on track in this scenario would require even greater emissions cuts from other sectors. Moving now to the light blue bar, we see our first scenario that implements diverse solutions. This scenario sees emissions reduced dramatically even though there's still that moderated level of zero emissions vehicle uptake. The inclusion of avoid and shift solutions in this scenario reduces the gap between the nation's transport emissions and our benchmark down to just 4% over the benchmark. So you might be wondering what happens if we do both? What happens if we combine a diverse solutions approach with that rapid zero emissions vehicle uptake? As you can see, it results in even deeper emissions. Emissions from this last scenario are 12% below the emissions benchmark. This is the most ambitious scenario that we modeled for the report, as it includes both that full suite of interventions, as well as that rapid pace of zero emissions vehicle uptake. But by achieving deeper emissions reductions in the transport sector, beyond what our economy-wide modeling says is a 1.5 aligned share for the transport sector, it eases pressure on other sectors that face hard to abate emissions or technology delays. So what can we take from all of this? Well, ClimateWorks modeling shows that it is possible for Australia to contribute, for Australia's transport sector to contribute to a 1.5 degree pathway by 2050. It also shows the impact that both the mix of, the, of decarbonization solutions, as well as the rate of zero emissions vehicle uptake can have on emissions reductions. But ultimately, it provides evident, an evidence base for which Australia can use to inform its transport decarbonization planning. And based on this modeling, we recommend that the following be applied to create a credible plan. Number one, implement a portfolio of solutions so there's no single point of failure. Rather than relying on technology change alone, incorporating a different so additional solutions allows Australia to pull on different levers should any one falter. 
like we saw in the technology only scenarios, when only relying on technology, emissions reduction is entirely dependent on the rate of zero emissions vehicle uptake, and to not hit uptake targets could risk overshooting the emissions benchmark, which we saw in that second scenario where it was 21% over the emissions benchmark. The second recommendation is to take every opportunity to increase zero emissions vehicle uptake from current levels. Transitioning technology is an indispensable part of decarbonizing transport. As we saw in our diverse solution scenario, with the addition of, of the void and shift interventions, it can offset overshoot emissions from some slowing to technology, but it can only do so much. We looked at zero emissions uh, light vehicle uptake in the slides, but our report also looks at the truck category. It'll be really important that we ratchet up zero emissions vehicle uptake as much as possible, especially in areas with existing momentum, such as light vehicles, which includes passenger cars, as well as light commercial vehicles, given that trucks may prove to be more challenging to transition, which we're happy to discuss further during our Q&A portion. And finally, number three, considering additional benefits beyond emissions reductions when assessing different approaches to decarbonize trans transport, which Helen spoke to a bit during her presentation. And you know these slides focus on the emissions reduction of each scenario, but we did in our report look at some broader things such as congestion, uh, as Helen mentioned. Um, and it's another topic we're happy to discuss further in the Q&A portion, but this recommendation is really a call for governments to consider overall outcomes for the sector when they're selecting decarbonization interventions and seeking both to improve the transport system while also reducing emissions. So that's it for our slides. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll pass it back to Michael. Thanks, Lily, for that excellent presentation. And I mean, what's really interesting about this work, I think, is that many listeners who have worked in the transport sector, you will have come across that avoid shift improved framework for decarbonizing transport. And so what's really exciting about this research is that it's putting some emissions numbers to that framework and the opportunities that those diverse solutions can bring. And I'm really looking forward to having the discussion with Lily and Helen uh, over the next uh, little while the remainder of this webinar. So with that, we are now going to open the floor for questions. So let's welcome back Helen and we'll kick off the discussion. Helen, I'm gonna to refer to you first with just straight straight to the, uh, the, the so what question, right? So got all these numbers, got this, this is a great report. It looks amazing. Kudos to our graphic design team for making it look so beautiful. But the thing is, what does this actually mean for, for government? Yeah, no, it's a great question to really bring it back to the, the what needs to happen next um, question. So. In delivering on this diverse solutions approach that, that Lily set out in, in her presentation is going to involve a shift in the way governments plan and, and fund transport. So that's uh, unavoidable. And really those processes of decision-making really need to start putting emissions reduction uh, at the core of, of how they, they decide what gets spent uh, and what sort of transport future we have. But I think the great thing is that, um, you know, particularly the new stuff in this report, which is the, the mode shift uh, and the, the void and shift sort of components here, these are things that governments at all levels in Australia uh, have been interested in pursuing for a very long time and not necessarily to do with emissions, but really it's around most Australians. So we're one of the most urbanised countries in the world. Most of us live in urban areas. Uh, we rely on things like public transport to get to work. And we know if we don't have those things uh, operating well in our city, we tend to get congestion or, or overcrowding. So these things are, are already in the system. Uh, and I know lots of local governments are very passionate about these things as well. So really it's about... Um, taking this moment to scale up those, those interventions that we're already doing uh, as much for transport efficiency uh, and livability that, as we are for, for emissions reduction benefit. Uh, but it's, it's important to realise it is a step change, but I think it's also important to look at uh, that it's a step change across all of these solutions, avoid, shift or improve. As, as Lily said, some of these uptake targets for things like um, freight and even uh, passenger vehicles, they're pretty, pretty challenging targets. And really what the modelling is trying to do is, is set a pathway of setting out what the level of effort is that we need to do to get there. And uh, and that's what this modelling has, has done. And uh, and yeah, looking forward to continuing the conversation about how we, how we go forth and implement this and scale up those things we care about already. 
Thanks, Helen. And um, you mentioned briefly in that response um, the issue of congestion as well, which I, um, I know has been a, a, a big topic of conversation for, for this particular um, area of analysis. And so just to segue to, I guess, another question that's come in, which is around um, some of the co-benefits um, uh, around decarbonizing, decarbonizing transport. And in particular, Lily, you mentioned in your slides uh, that there are you know additional benefits that need to be considered um, and, and targeted so could you explain to us you know what are some of those positive impacts beyond emissions reductions that you looked at in your modeling or in the report yeah, thanks michael um yes there are co-benefits for a diverse solutions approach and we did look at a, a, a few in more detail in the report um, the first was congestion. So with the majority of transport activity, activity happening in urban areas where congestion is, is already felt, um, you have to consider if you have a strategy that relies solely on transitioning ICE vehicles to zero emission vehicles, you risk just compounding that issue further, especially with population growth and more and more cars being added to the road. So by looking at a diverse solutions approach where you're avoiding some travel or you're shifting to other modes of transport like public and active transport or some road freight moves to rail freight, you could ease some of that pressure that we're seeing in congestion. So in our modeling, by adding in the avoid and shift interventions into our diverse solutions scenarios, there was a corresponding reduction in total vehicle kilometers traveled. So in comparison to our technology only scenarios, our diverse solution scenarios have a 27% decrease in vehicle kilometers traveled on all road vehicles and less vehicle kilometers traveled, less pressure on Australia's roads. So that was the first one. Uh, the second impact that we looked at was electricity demand. Uh, as sectors across Australia's economy are decarbonizing, electricity demand is set to go up. So any way that we can reduce demand is going to be a good thing. Um, by 2050, Australia's transport sector is set to make up a quarter of the electricity demand. So when we look at our two scenarios, uh, technology our technology-only scenarios go from a seven terawatt hours of demand now to about 221 terawatt hours in 2050, um, I believe. <laughs> Check the report if these aren't specific numbers. Um, and that's that increase is accounting for electricity for charging all different types of vehicles, powering rail systems, the production of, of hydrogen. And then when we compare that to our diverse solution scenarios, which again, have those avoid and shift interventions to reduce travel or move to other modes, maybe lower power modes, we see a 9% reduction in electricity demand in our diverse solution scenarios, which 9% is actually pretty significant. By 2050, it accounts for about 20 terawatt hours of electricity, um, which is putting in context about three times as much electricity as the entire transport sector uses today. So um, those are some things we looked at in the report, but uh, Helen, if you wanna add any, any other co-benefits no, I think that's a really good summary, Lily. And I, I'm sure there's other things that people who are on this call are really passionate about, like things like, like safety and health. There's other co-benefits we would have loved to have explored, um, but within the scope of this work, we're really focusing on uh, emissions and then things we could easily pick up through through what was being modelled in the report. But really interested to hear from, from other people uh, about other co-benefits that, that are important in this space too. Thanks for both of you. So now I'm going to change tack a little bit to the challenges side of things. And we've had a, um, a, a few comments um, on, in the Q&A, just to remind everyone also, if you have any questions, if any reminder, pop them into the Q&A for us. Uh, we are going through them and um, using them to inform these questions. Um, we have a number of questions around the challenges, particularly in the freight sector. And so maybe, um, Helen, would you be able to talk to us about how the challenges in the freight sector, both in terms of uh, decarbonising decarbonizing the truck fleet, but also shifting patterns around the freight sector um, in terms of where demand goes and the infrastructure that supports that. How, how are some of those challenges being addressed in, in your work and in the report? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, thanks for everyone who's put that in the chat. Um, look, there's a really lively conversation and enthusiastic conversation going on in the freight logistics sector. You know, they really, uh, really starting to grapple with these issues. So that's really heartening to see. 
I think one of the things we're looking at in our report particularly was around this uptake, as Lily set out in her in her slides. Our modelling was assuming, uh, was looking predominantly at technology-focused solutions. So, uh, you know, the model had this thing to solve for, so it, it had quite high uptake rates. But actually, um, the report we put out last year on freight decarbonisation, we spent a lot of time talking to, to governments and industry and just of hearing, I guess, stories from the ground about where there's some challenges are in place. And some of these are regulatory. Some of these are the nature of freight in Australia and and they're complex issues. And I guess that's part of the reason, as as Lily said in the, in the report, we're sort of thinking about that this avoid and shift and going taking a diverse solutions approach can build us a bit of a buffer in terms of how we reduce emissions. But I guess what I, I think the report we've put out invites is to the people to think about Where's this bit buffer that we've created best deployed? Like which part of the transport sector is going to need to buy a bit more time to, to make that transition? And, and I suspect that freight's going to be the one where this is going to happen. In terms of specific um, challenges there, that we know with um, rigid e electric, uh, zero emission trucks, uh, there's both electric and hydrogen um, out there in the market. There's been restrictions on actually being able to deploy them on Australia's roads, whether from um, uh, width limits last year, I think some of that's been resolved now, um, axle mass, mass limits, um, conversations going about, um, you know, is the infrastructure we have in place ready for these vehicles, which which could potentially be a bit bit heavier. So we're working through some of those regulatory um, uh, issues at the moment. Equally, we've just got a very large number of small operators in freight. Like a lot of people are, are owner drivers. Um, and that's like, if you're a large freight operating company, it's a bit easy to do that forward planning to think about um, transport decarbonisation and how you transition your fleet. If you've got one truck, that's a little bit more com complex to kind of uh, think through that process. So they're just some of the, the, the real world challenges um, in, in that space. I think something we touched on in our freight report last year and this report as well is there's also a degree of uncertainty in, in that articulated truck space. So in those heavier trucks um, that you see doing, you know, more long haul or very heavy loads, um, you know, whether that's going to be a hydrogen or electric solution uh, is not entirely clear yet. It's really about working out what's the right technology um, for the different types of uses. So, it, again, it's a little bit hard for companies, even large companies, to plan ahead for where do they need to invest to make that transition happen. So we've been kind of taking that into account in how we've approached this the modelling task that we've done uh, this year. So, yeah, uh, happy to talk more to people about uh, freight decarbonisation in the future, though. It's going to be an exciting topic, I think, in the years ahead. Thanks, Helen. I've got a follow-up question for Lily as well, um, just on the, the topic of trucks. So there is additional analysis in the report around zero emissions trucks specifically. Um, could you speak to what's actually in the report and what people can expect to find when they read that section? Yes. Happy to give a little teaser for folks who uh, venture over to the report. So because of the challenges and some of the uncertainty that, that Helen just outlined there for the zero emission truck transition, we conducted an additional piece of analysis to understand what the impact on emissions would be if zero emissions trucks was slower than even our, our moderated rate of uptake. Um, so what we did was we isolated the truck category from our modeling results, and then we delayed the zero emissions truck uptake by five years just to simulate what an overall slowing of, of uptake could look like. What we found is that by the inclusion of diverse solutions, and if light vehicles maintain that rapid level of zero emissions vehicles uptake, a five-year delay in the truck category leaves the transport sector emissions just 1% over that emissions benchmark. So again, by doing this piece of analysis, it was not our intention to propose a delay or even suggest that there would be one. It was to see, as Helen was saying, what buffer can be created by pulling on our different levers. And, you know, government can use this as an example to consider which areas of the transition might need more time, where we can go harder, and where diverse solutions can help create that buffer. Thanks, Lily. Now we're getting quite a number of questions about assumptions. And so rather than asking you, what are the assumptions in the modeling? Because that's obviously a very large uh, question to answer that there's a whole report dedicated to. I'm going to try and break it down into some of the sub questions within that. Um, probably one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest, I guess, uh, 
innovative areas in which this modeling is addressed, some of those avoid and shift assumptions is a particular around mode shift. And so that is a question for Helen. Um, how ambitious is the mode shift that's assumed in these scenarios compared to, you know, what you've kind of seen in your engagement with the transport industry? And in particular, um, can you talk to the, the, the amount of active travel and public transport that will be required to, to meet that sort of mode shift that's been assumed in these modelling scenarios? Yeah, it's a great question. And I have to say, um, for anyone interested in doing transport modelling in the future, <clears throat> it's a very tricky question to answer. Uh, uh, how much mode shift is possible in Australia, uh, whether that's um, in passenger transport or in freight? Because I guess it's one of those things where... Um, to some extent, it's how much effort can we possibly put into this and how can we get those settings right to really encourage that to happen. But it's a good question. Uh, in formulating this, this, this research, uh, we were balancing up a couple of things. We wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just take a tip, sip of water. Um, we we're trying to balance up a couple of things which were um, what's the level of ambition we could possibly reach, like what's what's viable in a similar city to, to Australia. And then what's needed, you know, as Lily said, <laughs> if we don't reach that rapid uptake and only reach a moderated uptake, um, what's going to be needed to break, make up that difference? And really in doing this report, that's really the key thing that was driving us. How do we breach that gap if we only reach a moderate level, a moderated level of, of zero emission uptake? But that being said, we did an extensive amount of research to look at what, what similar countries were doing, um, looking at their individual case studies or looking at what's coming out, particularly what's coming out at similar, similar countries to Australia. What are they putting in their transport decarbonisation plan and what sort of goals are they sort of setting? So the mode shift is certainly ambitious. Um, and I guess we were looking at what level of ambition is needed to breach that gap. I think what's important in thinking about the report is to think of these things, as, as Lily, Lily alluded to, as levers that we can pull. So in each of these solutions, I think we've probably pushed them all as hard as they could possibly go as we're pushing out our different scenarios. And what I suspect is that the pathway, the, the best pathway to reach 1.5 in Australia, is going to be really about balancing um, and pulling those levers in different ways uh, in, in line with sort of what viable. I guess what's the key thing for this report is just having more irons in the fire is going to be really important so that we can um, you know, spread that load a bit and not not one part of it is, is taking on uh, all, all that pressure. But but you, you just can go through the report. We've included assumptions there. For anyone who's super keen, there's also a 50 or 60 page technical report. And you know, people are also welcome to chat to us um, by contacting us offline if they want to um, dig through the detail in a little bit more um, in a bit more depth after this uh, talk today. Thanks, Helen. And I think the irons in the fire analogy is so apt for the approach that's being taken here in terms of, you know, making sure we do have a range of solutions available. Um, also, may or may not be a transport pun referring to trains. I'm not sure. I'm not good enough for transport to know whether that's the case. But um, it, just on the assumptions side of things, I guess going back to the good old EV uptake assumptions, which is obviously also a key part of the way in which the scenarios are defined, um, would you be able to describe maybe Lily, um, Say this next one, you could would you able to come up, um, uh, explain to us how you came up with the electric vehicle uptake rates that were assumed in those different scenarios in the modeling? Sure thing. So, both of the zero emissions vehicles uptake rates came from work that CSIRO did for their electric vehicle projections, which were developed for use by AEMO or the Australian Energy Market Operator. Um, so they had a few. We adopted the two more ambitious ones in, in our modeling. And this is all outlined in uh, the technical report that Helen mentioned for those very keen. Yeah, great, thank you. And, and actually it ties, ties in with the, a few queries that come in around the observations that those EV uptake rates are ambitious. They are above, for example, current government projections or current government targets. You know, that's pretty clearly shown in the chart that you showed in your presentation earlier. So, how are we tracking against those two levels of um, ZDV uptake? Um, you know, are you confident that the, the sorts of enablers that are required to see the rapid EV uptake in those scenarios that are assumed in those scenarios, do you, do you, do you feel confident that it'd be achievable? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, Look, as Lily said, we've taken these out of the CSIRO work they did for AEMO, but they've had some good, really good guidelines for just giving us two different scenarios to look through. 
Look, things are changing rapidly. Um, look, something we've been looking at very keenly. And anyone that's read our previous reports will know we're very passionate about um, vehicle efficiency standards. And it's been really great to see the government put out the new vehicle efficiency standards just uh, um, just very recently passing the, the parliament. Um, we've done a bit of analysis of what's um, in the design of that. Um, it can be a little bit hard to match what's in that public report with what's in our modelling, but we suspect that that's running maybe a little bit um, below that moderated uptake uptake level, but, um, yeah, it's uh, yeah a little bit hard to line up those numbers. But, look, that's that's one um, that's one policy that can be put in place to, to boost um, um, EV uptake. So we kind of have to consider that to be that's seen the floor. Um, we should be looking at a range of policies to keep boosting um, uptake in the future. And uh, we did put out a report a couple of years ago on accelerating EV uptake, which really, again, called for that um, a, a broad range of solutions. Importantly, in different phases, and I think what's been the critical phase that we've been trying to address through the efficiency standards is, is addressing supply. If we don't have EVs come into the country, we, we just can't buy them, can we? So I think we're now looking at um, a broader suite of emissions and also recognising that there's a bit of flow to this. You know, you'll have it earlier adopters who really want to uptake, uh, uptake early, but thinking about all the different vehicle users through that cycle and who, who's who's all, what are all those cars in the fleet and how do we sw swatch them out uh, over time? So that's I think that's in the EV space. So I think, again, thinking about the new vehicle efficiency standard as a floor and thinking about other policies that we can use to, to boost that transition, um, you know, including things like charging infrastructure. On the freight side, again, conveniently, it's very convenient we've put out these pre previous reports. The freight report we put out last year goes into this in a bit more detail, but I think really for us at the moment it's um, uh, encouraging. I think um, vans will come under that new vehicle efficiency standard, so that should see a bit of an um, acceleration there. Um, and in the rigid trucks, we think uh, in our report last year, we we noted that that's, if you combine light commercial vehicles and those um, more medium-sized trucks, that's about half of the transport emissions uh, in, in freight. So getting some out of the way, some of those like more regulatory roadblocks around axle mass limits or access and those kinds of things, I think that's really important because you can see an industry that's keen to take up new technology and reduce emissions where they can. And maybe it's going to take a little bit longer to do that in the, in the long haul area, but how do we get rid of those, um, those barriers to, to the zero emission rigid trucks? Thanks, Helen. Now, stepping out of the EVs again to the broader avoid shift and proof framework. Um, I mean, in EVs, you, you often hear about um, countries like Norway being a really, you know, an inspiration for Australia in terms of EV uptake. Um, but you don't really hear much discussion around the broader avoid shift and proof framework and what countries and what jurisdictions are doing that really well. So maybe a question for Lily, in your research that you've done um, for this report, were there any other countries that you saw as being a really good inspiration for Australia to to, to learn from and to draw in terms of that broader framework that you're talking about in this report? Absolutely. Uh, our report includes a whole host of examples of avoid, shift, and improve solutions being implemented around the globe. There's no one perfect country example for Australia to follow because all countries are different, but we do in the report have lots of examples of different places from New Zealand to Europe, to the US, um, and examples of, of, of each of those interventions. Uh, some countries even have targets attached to some of their avoid shift and improve interventions, which Australia can definitely learn from. You know, New Zealand has a target for reducing kilometers traveled by their light vehicle fleet. The UK has uh, active transport targets, as well as um, a target for moving a percentage of freight by rail. Um, so, so some of these, which again, more detail found in the report, there's lots of examples for those interested, but can paint a picture um, of what that looks like. Yes, lots of lots of rich reading for everyone to be able to, to do in the report with those case studies. It's just amazing how much information is out there. Um, that that is, you know, summarized in this, this great publication. Um, one, I guess there is one interesting observation that a lot of our conversation, uh, what one of the audience members has made observation, that a lot of the conversation today has been very road focused, you know, given the focus on EVs. Um, maybe a question again for you, Lily, but also maybe for you, Helen, afterwards. Um, what sort of role do you see? rail playing in supporting the transition, both in terms of the role that it plays within the modelling, but also more broadly um, as, a, yeah, as a way of supporting an alternative to, to road-based transport. 
Well, we see rail for both freight and passenger transport. That example that I mentioned about the UK, I believe their target was 75% of, of rail of freight by rail. So um, it, rail can play a big part in, in mode shift for both passenger and freight. But I'll uh, pass to Helen if she would like to add. Yeah, we, we love rail, uh, as much rail as possible. Um, I think, I'd say, again, um, I'd be interested to see, I know there's other um, groups out there at the moment doing a bit more work on, particularly on rail freight, as Lily talked about. Um, I think it really at the moment we're at a point where it's mapping out, you know, because there are some challenges in um, in decarbonising some of the vehicle stock at the moment, it, like if you think about it, if, if you're a big company and you are um, uh, thinking about how you, you've got to maybe have, maybe have to report on your emissions, and so you're looking around and thinking about, well, what transport do I use? Um, and often it's not within your company. It's what you you you, you purchase in um, to get your goods and services around. But you're starting to make those questions around, um, well, we've got to report to the government on um, our emissions. And for them, transport is considered to be what's called a scope three emission. So it's not your direct emission. It's 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 something else that relates to your to your um, to your operations, but not directly. So we're still seeing lots of interest of people saying, well, is this something, uh, you know, I can't seem to get um, maybe zero emission trucks aren't available for this type of work yet. So, you know, particularly if it, you know, if you if you need some help in that transition, you might be looking to reduce your transport emissions first. So we're certainly hearing lots more interest coming to um, uh, rail freight saying, is this something we could, we could travel on train? But I think more work is needed there to map out where the opportunities are. For example, we know that um, bulk freight is very popular. It's a very strong field for for trains because they can carry a lot of it and they can carry it at long distances. But I think more work's needed there to really work out what that is. And if we're going to start moving more things on trains, we need to make sure that start and end of the trip really works well. How are those trucks who are delivering to trains, you know, if you're in an urban area, how do you get on off the train and make that a seamless transition. So I think there's a couple of areas, um, but I think as a country we need to think about what role we want rail to play in our transport future and start planning for that now. Great. Thanks to both of you. And time has flown and we actually only have time for one more question. So I'm going to ask um, for a slightly different topic around embodied carbon. And so the question is, has the modelling considered embodied carbon and in particular, how, for example, the shift levers could, um, uh, how that interacts with, for example, the increased embodied carbon in building new infrastructure and also the embodied carbon in things like building new EVs and the charging infrastructure um, related to that. Uh, Helen? That's a fantastic question, close to my heart. Um, uh, if you're keen to look at this, we have touched on this in the technical report because it's something we really would like to do more work on in the future. So I guess to think about it, um, actually, Going back to that scope three discussion we had a little while ago, depending, you know, it gets, does get very complicated, but you can think about scope three emissions or, you know, actually we can talk about as embodied carbon or life cycle emissions. Is in the modeling we've looked at to date, we're really looking at scope one and two emissions, which is tailpipe emissions and what's coming out of the electricity sector. But but if we decide uh, to take a diverse solutions approach, and as Lily said, that can reduce the number of um, car trips on the on the on our roads. If that means a 30 or 27 percent reduction in VKT, that could mean we don't need to build a hell of a lot of new new road infrastructure. And constructing that infrastructure and maintaining it um, uh, has significant costs involved with it. Another source of embodied carbon is actually the vehicles themselves. You know, if if the population grows and we don't have a one to one relationship of uh, every person buys a car, but we share cars or move more freight by rail. Um, these are all opportunities for us to reduce all the carbon across the system, not just thinking about the direct carbon coming from tailpipe and, and electricity demand. So it's, it's a really important area, particularly as our grid starts to decarbonize and we're all driving electric vehicles. In the latter part of our modeling, embodied carbons becomes more and life cycle emissions become uh, more important. So good question to end with, because I'd say watch this space. We're hoping to do more work on this uh, in the future. Thank you, Helen. So that does bring us to the end of our discussion. Thank you so much to our speakers, Helen and Louis. I also want to pass our thanks to the team behind the scenes, Sophie Stefanakis, Simon Brown and Tyra Horngren. This absolutely would not be possible to put this event on without your help and uh, support. As Climateworks is a philanthropically funded organisation, we also extend our heartfelt appreciation to the funders of this work, the Boundless Foundation and the Lim Family Foundation. 
Their support made this modeling and report and engagement work possible. And we warmly welcome new partners to join us in bridging the gap between research and action. You can find out more about our work and catch up on this and previous briefing rooms at our website, climateworkcenter.org. So we'll be sending through a recording from this session as well as links to the resources discussed. So do keep an eye out on your inbox in the next couple of days. The report that we spoke about and that we just dropped today is called Decarbonising Australia's Transport Sector. And you will find the link on the Climateworks Centre website. We do hope that you can join us for the next briefing room event. More information on that session will be coming soon. But for now, thank you for joining us. See you next time.